Uh, for those I've not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Frank Principe, and I am your Woodbridge representative on the Prince William Board of County Supervisors, serving my 10th year as a real labor of love. Uh, and working with the Civic Association has been one of the most uh, satisfying parts of the job over the last decade. So let me give a plug to the Civic Association before I go any farther. I see some new faces out there. That's always a great thing. Uh, the Civic Association uh, works extremely hard in this community to uh, keep you all aware of what's going on in the community and to obtain your feedback. Uh, and they have a number of annual events that are recurring. This is one of them with our legislative and uh, uh, elected officials. Uh, they also do a boat tour uh, on the Occoquan River. That's a lot of fun, that's coming up. Uh, they do cleanups of Route 1, so I think there's one coming up this weekend actually. They do cleanups of Neamsco Creek as well. Uh, and uh, they do uh, monthly meetings where we bring in landowners developers, property owners, to talk about future development and what that means for the community, the impacts on schools and traffic and that sort of thing. So uh, the Civic Association, membership in the Civic Association is really, you're on the bottom floor of helping to build what I call a new wood bridge. Uh, so I would encourage you to come out more often, uh, support the program. At the registration table was a membership form, very simple to fill out, absolutely free. Uh, and at least you'll get on a mailing list uh, to be able to receive information uh, that the uh, uh, membership uh, does, gets. And I'm happy to say that um, they've been at it uh, so long that they're going to be celebrating uh, their 10th anniversary uh, in the fall. Uh, so I know there's going to be a, a heck of a party, right, Verna? It is going to be a party. Uh, for the 10th yeah. year. Uh, and if you have any ideas about what we might be able to do, uh, the planning committee is all ears. Uh, and they have their own website, WPCCA, Woodbridge Potomac Community Civic Association, WPCCA.org, uh, for additional information. Tonight's event, uh, again an annual event, is really about bringing the community together to meet our state legislators that represent Woodbridge and the General Assembly in Richmond. This event is designed to provide you all with a better understanding of what happened and what didn't happen in Richmond. Sometimes what didn't happen is, is as interesting as what did happen. Uh, the event is a bit unique this year uh, because, um, number one, uh, the General Assembly, House and Senate were not able to come to terms with a budget yet. Uh, so they're in special session. Uh, and we have two of the four um, elected representatives who are new, who were just elected uh, last November and are representing Woodbridge uh, for their first term. Um, and uh, our state legislators have been asked tonight to take about five to seven minutes, and uh, somebody is going to be keeping time, five to seven minutes each, and share with us your perspective of uh, uh, um, what you think about the job, what you think about what occurred in the General Assembly, um, the legislation that you uh, introduced, legislation that may be passed, uh, and um, what it means to be a delegate or a state senator. Uh, and then once uh, they're done with each of their five to seven minutes, then we're gonna throw the uh, program into questions and answers. And we'll go to about 8.40, as late as we possibly can, and then I'm gonna turn the program back over to the Civic Association, who's gonna be talking a little bit about the upcoming program, so everybody has first-hand knowledge. But before I introduce our guests, let me just provide a couple of observations, my own personal observations, about what happened in Richmond this time. Because as you know, for us to be successful in Woodbridge, we have to work as a team uh, between your elected officials at the local, state, and the federal level. Uh, and if we work as a team and we work as a machine, we can actually get more things done for you and improve our quality of life for all. So uh, bear with me on some numbers some facts and figures. Um, just shy of 3,000 bills were introduced in the General Assembly in this last session. 2,778 bills. Who's keeping count, right? A third of those, so just shy of 1,000 of those bills, were passed. That's probably better than more supervisors, right? 50-55% um, of those bills 
were killed, terminated, 55%. 12% of the bills were, that were introduced were either consolidated into other bills or carried over to the next uh, session. Okay. Okay. Fewer bills were passed this year than the last three years. Fewer bills were passed this year than last year, three year before, and three years ago. So fewer bills passed. We also saw a substantial decrease, 50% or so, decrease in the number of bills that were killed without a vote. And I'm going to let my guess, my guess, tell you what that means. Yeah, tell me a bill without a vote. Who's accountable for that? That's changed. There was also an increase in the number of bills that were consolidated uh, and or carried over <coughs> from this session to next year's session. These numbers suggest that the near 50-50 split of the political parties in both chambers of the General Assembly resulted in greater bipartisanship between the parties and between the House and Senate. One of the most significant debates, uh, one, not, not the only necessarily, most significant debates was what some called affordable access to health care and what others called the expansion of Medicaid. Same, right? No, maybe not so. Uh, and um, uh, what the House just did here a day or so ago was to pass Medicaid expansion that will provide affordable access to health care, if I'm not uh, mistaken, to about 400,000 uh, uh, low-income adults in Virginia. The Senate's not there yet, and that is that is why we are in special session. So with that, let me uh, uh, introduce our panelists. Um, Senator Jeremy Pike uh, represents the 29th Senate District and was first elected in 2015. His district includes parts of Prince William County and the cities of Manassas and Manassas Park. He currently serves on the Senate Committees for Local Government, General Laws and Technology, and Rehabilitation and Social Services. Uh, and when he is not working for us in Richmond, he serves as the Director of General Services for the City of Alexandria. And in his spare time, which I'm not sure where that is, but in his spare time, he serves as a volunteer firefighter at the Dale City Volunteer Fire Department, a, 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 a firefighter and an EMT. Uh, next to him on this side is Senator Scott Cervell. Uh, Senator Cervell represents the 36th Senate District, comprised of parts of Prince William, Fairfax, and Stafford. He has served in the Virginia General Assembly since 2009. So Senator Surabell started as a delegate and then got promoted by you, the voters, to the Virginia Senate. Uh, he too serves on the committees for local government, general laws, and rehabilitation and such. Well, what's going on with this, sir? How about budget or finance or right? uh, both serving on the same committees? Uh, and uh, uh, Senator Surabell uh, got his law degree from the University of Virginia and is a founding partner of Surabell, Isaacs, and Levy uh, Law Firm, uh, just north of here in Fairfax. Now, with us for the first time is Delegate Elizabeth Guzman. Uh, Delegate Guzman is representing the 31st House District, which serves part of Prince William and Fauquier counties. Uh, Delegate Guzman holds a master's degree in public administration and social work and is the division chief of adult services for the city of Alexandria. So I'm wondering whether the senator and the delegates see each other in the hallways. If they both work for the city of Alexandria, I was a different building, I'm sure. Right? Um, and then also with us for the first time is Delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy. Uh, Delegate Foy represents the second house district comprised of parts of Prince William and Stafford counties. She was elected this past November shortly after the birth of twin boys. Oh, wow. You're talking about having your hands full. But let me go on. This is, I mean, it's, she really has her hands full. She is a graduate of VMI, Virginia Military Institute. 
She's a public defender in Arlington County uh, and a foster parent. And with that, what I'd like to do is uh, let uh, the four of them decide who goes, who goes first uh, with five to seven minutes. Once they're done with their opening remarks, we'll come back uh, and take your questions and your comments, and we'll go from there. Who would like to start? Great. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Supervisor. It's good to be here. It's my third Woodbridge uh, Civic post legislative post mortem, I guess it is. Uh, actually, we're not even done yet, so uh, we still have a budget to pass, but uh, it's always good to be down here. Uh, as you heard Frank say, I represent the 36th district. It starts around the Woodrow Wilson Bridge and Kingstown, comes together at Mason Neck, comes across the Occupan right here, and it goes up Old Bridge Road up to the uh, gym library and then swings around down down the river down through here and then back up 234 up to Montclair and then uh, down the whole Whitewater Peninsula and then out 610 Garrisonville Road out to North Stafford High School. So 200,000 people, 60 miles long and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful district to represent. A lot of Potomac River, a lot of people who care about the water, a lot of Route 1. Um, I'm going to talk, all of us, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to talk about Medicaid, I'm going to leave that to the body that actually passed Medicaid. Um, even though Jeremy and I actually do support it, and we have from the beginning, but uh, I want to hit on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I passed out. Of, I hope everybody got everything I passed out. I have my 2018 legislative agenda. I put in 61 bills this year, 21 budget amendments, um, and uh, passed, I think, about 14 bills, um, which is in my session recap letter. I'm not sure everybody got that. I have a bunch of those if you want to see that. And then I have this constituent service flyer sort of explaining some of the things I can do. Maybe you'll like to see that. Um, but before I get to that, I'm going to barely talk about that. I just want to highlight a couple things really quick that I think are probably are coming up over the next eight months, which might be important. Today, we have big news today. The uh, state announced um, opportunity, um, opportunity zone designations in, in the state. What that is is the federal government passed the Tax Reform Act a couple of years ago. I wasn't a big fan of it. But one of the things they did do was create these special zones that look out or that states could designate to enhance or to create investment. Uh, they create a lot of tax deferrals to investors. And five of the census tracts in Prince William County that were designated or nominated by the governor today were right here in Woodbridge. Um, they start um, not where we're standing right now, but basically the railroad tracks going to the west, including um, all that area between Route 1 and railroad tracks, all around that, Tone Mills Mall. And um, I was talking to a big, Really trust uh, investor, senior vice president today, and said this: these designations will change the calculus for whether or not to build and how to build and when to build, because they allowed them to defer cap gains taxes for 10 years. And I think it's going to be could be a big game changer for, for North Woodbridge, for for Eastern Prince William County. And that was just announced today by the governor. The federal government still has to certify those districts, but there's a whole bunch along Route One, also in Fairfax County. So I was really excited to see that happen. Um, the second thing, um, we have Smart Scale coming up in November. What that is is the process by which we decide which transportation improvements to fund. And that dovetails a little bit into Metro. Uh, you may have read the paper yesterday, or this morning, that uh, yet yesterday we had a big fight about the Metro funding. We did pass a bill that, that does provide Metro the funding that it needs to match Maryland and D.C.'s funding. The problem, though, is, is that what we did, the way we funded it, we diverted uh, transportation funds from the NBTA. And that's uh, the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority's authority we set up in 2013, funded with Northern Virginia taxes to fund Northern Virginia projects. And the whole idea behind it at the time was to pass taxes that we would pay only here in Northern Virginia, we would pay for new projects here in Northern Virginia, transit and roads. And um, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, including led by uh, Tim Hugo, who's a Northern Virginia delegate, uh, insisted that we do this without raising taxes. And what that means is we're basically taking up $400 million out of transit, out of road projects, and using it to fund Metro. And what we, I think all of us wanted to do was to, uh, we had a, a small tax increase, a dollar a night on hotels, and a small tax increase on, um, on selling a home. It'd be about $250 for every half a million dollars of home value. When you sell the house, it would have plugged that $400 million hole so we wouldn't have to sacrifice new, new new opportunities, new transportation improvements for old. And that failed in the House of Delegates by uh, two votes. It passed in the Senate by about 10, 9, 10 votes. But um, we have, I think, 
five, six Republicans crossed over and voted with us, but in the House of Delegates, uh, they stood together as a block and blocked it. And so now, uh, we have a whole bunch of projects along the Room 1 corridor that need to be funded. And if you take $400 million out of the funding stream over a 10-year period, the projects are going to get pushed back. And many of them are in Prince William, many of them are in Fairfax. Uh, and unfortunately, that's what happened yesterday. Um, and I think all of us are going to try and do something to fix that next year. But this fall, we have the process by which all these projects are decided what's going to be funded. You all have the, route, the 123 Route 1 interchange right here, which is going to be on that list. The Route 1 widening um, below Neapsco, well, the city below Neapsco is funded, I think you said, right? But uh, the part through Dumfries isn't funded yet. And there's some other smaller projects over here that need to get funded, but that's coming up this fall. So keep your eye on that. Uh, we're all going to be, I'm sure, out there navigating and fighting for those things. Um, in terms of bills, take a look at my bills. Uh, again, I'm going to, when I stand down in a second, I'm going to keep passing these things out. Everybody doesn't have it, but um, Bills that are of interest to you all, um, at the very bottom you'll see, well, you have my General Assembly recap letter I sent out. Uh, my coal ash bill is the one that's probably most immediate importance to, to eastern Prince William County. For those of you who don't know, we have, there's four massive coal ash dumps in Virginia. Uh, for 60 years in Virginia, we burned coal to generate electricity. We took the stuff that came out of the furnace, we dumped it in these ponds right next to the town of the river. There's four million cubic yards of coal ash sitting down there in Dumfries right now, right off the Potomac River, leaching out uh, arsenic, leaching out uh, chromium, leaching out hexavalent chromium, stuff that's really great for your complexion. Uh, it's poisoned a bunch of wells and people who are dependent on well water there on Boston Point. And we need to dig that. The EPA said we need, to, we need to get that, we need to keep get it out of the ponds that it's in and store it in some other fashion. And Dominion would like to just put a rubber tarp over it and some dirt and grass and call it a day. Myself, I think, I think everybody up here, I know Delia Foy, who represents the area, really strongly believes about this because she lives right next to it, that we need to dig it up. We need to dig it up and either make it into products, recycle it into things, they actually use coal ash to make concrete. Uh, they used to make, um, you can use it to make all kinds of different things. Uh, bricks, we'd either like to do that or just dig it up and haul it away and put it in a modern landfill so it's not leaching into our water here in the Potomac. And uh, Senate Bill 807 created a, a basically a study process where over the next year we're not going to do anything except look at this problem trying to figure out how to solve it. And the reason it's going to take that long is a multi-billion dollar problem. It's a five to probably ten billion dollar problem and you're going to pay for it. All of us will pay for it. You, if you burn electricity in your house to pay Dominion energy for your light bill, then you will pay for it. And before we authorize Dominion to spend five to ten billion dollars of your money, we want to make sure we're doing it the right way in a way that we'll have to do it a second time in a way that's uh, going to help the environment. So, um, Delta, Carol Foy is going to be up with me on a joint subcommittee. We're going to look at that issue and figure it out. But um, that's probably the most immediate importance to Eastern Prince William. The other thing is, I'm sure people don't want about 200,000 dump trucks running up and down Route 1, running up and down Dumfries Road, hauling that stuff in and out. So we're going to try and figure out a way to do it that minimizes impact on the community and, and, and helps the environment and save us the most money. So that that's a big issue coming up. Um, it's immediate importance to this area. And uh, other than that, um, I'm going to just leave, I'm going to stop there. And, uh, I'm sure if you look through all this stuff, you can find some questions to ask me about all the bills I put in and either passed or died. Uh, but uh, I thought overall we had a pretty good session. Um, it wasn't, I would agree with Frank that uh, the numbers, the changes in the House of Delegates uh, have definitely created, I think, a more bipartisan environment down there. They can't treat delegates like roadkill like when I was there. Um, when I was there, I was one of 32 out of 100. Uh, my job was to be a speed bump, and that was about it. But uh, now that there's 49 of them, they have to pay attention to these women over here, and, uh, and it's a little different environment over there. The Senate has always been a little different. The Senate, it's a much smaller body, it's always been much, much closer. Uh, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons I've been so successful legislatively. I mean, I got, I think I passed 28 bills in the last, in the last uh, two sessions. In my first six sessions, I think I passed about eight. So, uh, it's, it's the Senate. The Senate has definitely always had that tradition, but or recently had that tradition. But um, the last thing was the budget, and I think you'll see the budget resolved probably in about between a month and a month and a half. Um, we've had a couple members on the other side announce that they're they're that they're going to come around on Medicaid, but it's going to take some time for that to play out. You know, we have to negotiate a 105 billion dollar two year budget, and you just don't do that like on the drop of a pen. So it's going to take some time for that to sort out. People to figure out how much money we have to spend figure out what we want to do with it, and then negotiate that with the House and come to a conclusion on it. But we're, we're getting there. We've never shut the government down in Virginia, as far as ever, I think. I don't think it'll happen this time. So um, we want to wait for the end for questions. Or? Yes. Hi. Um, 
Oh, okay. That's your hand. Okay, good. And I want to hand these, keep handing these things out. Um, raise your hand. If you still need that. Jeremy's next. All right. All right. Um, Jeremy St. Pike, represent the 29th Center District. I will try not to cover some of the same ground, uh, but to highlight a couple things, uh, just to emphasize, I think all of us are worried about the impacts of the Metro Funding Bill in terms of the money that I've, my district runs from Route 1 to Route 28. So those are two and two of the worst roads in Northern Virginia and in the entire Commonwealth. So missing that $100 million over this time period is a significant, significant deal. That, that we're concerned about. Uh, a couple things that uh, we're also, I'm also looking at is the, the new Easy Pass uh, toll extension down to Fredericksburg included the $300 million concession that is now for the corridors improvements along 95. So I'm hoping that we can grab some of that money for our Aquan uh, Bridge down to Prince Wing Parkway where we all know that it bottlenecks every single night. Um, that's been backlogged for years, and so hopefully that's a new funding source that we can apply along the 95 corridor. That'll be a part of the statewide CDB uh, Commonwealth Transportation Board competitive process. But I mean, everybody knows all I, all I have to say is the Occoquan Bridge. And if they live anywhere on the East Coast, then they know they know where exactly where they're headed. So that's something that's in the pipeline still years mm -hmm. out, but we need to start to talk about it the foundations now. Uh, you know, working with uh, Supervisor Principe, as he said, working as a team. I know that the board is getting these sort of projects into the queue so it can get uh, rated um, and ranked against other statewide projects. So that's you know, important that we start talking about, hey, there's a resource, let's get it in, let's, let's work this through the process. Uh, one of those I worked on this year, uh, one of the things that drove me crazy about the Easy Pass process was uh, if you ever, anybody have the flex easy pass so you can pick up slots and for free? Well, if you didn't use that, you got in six months you get charged ten dollars, and frankly, it drove me nuts that you're already paying for the system. So I had to be wipe that out for at least give me a year. Uh, they wouldn't go dismantle it all the way, but at least I got it to a year, so they're not going to get charged an additional ten dollar fee. To me, it's just a nuisance fee uh, for a system you're already paying uh, paying for, and you shouldn't have to pay again. So um, that actually failed uh, last year. I brought up again this year and kept on fighting for it. So we got we got that bill passed. Um, we I hear some small claps. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, overall, the the you know, the, the toll framework ship sailed years ago before I took office. Now it's, I'm finally making sure we have a common language. Uh, that's been part of my issues with the, how the 66 project is rolled out. Uh, with sort of a different set of rules for which road you ride on. Uh, and I think it's confusing. Uh, I think the uh, challenge may not to do a much better job of communicating and for the 66 project. I know some might use it, but probably not a lot here, but they didn't build the parking lots yet before they started the toll, and it's fast backwards if you ask me. You need to build the infrastructure, you need to build lots, to give people an opportunity to slug. And 66 does not have a slug culture that can keep your knees in. You know, you years and years of picking up riders and so there's a huge transition that's going on the western side of the county over the next five to six years that is going to be a significant challenge as that core uh, and project takes hold. And that, that is a massive project uh, that will make some uh, travel time improvements. Um, I've also been working on the Horn Road Tuner on here. Uh, the, there's some security enhancements after the wheel thefts that occurred uh, that you might have seen on the news. We had a significant number of hits between 2000 15 to the early 2017, um, I got some funding designated through VDOT, and there's now some security enhancements. They caught, the, and the number of real thefts have dropped. I haven't ever report. You might have more up, recent updates than I do, but they dropped significantly after we made some improvements to the lot. So, not on wood that, that, that continues. I'm not jinx it. But uh, I've also uh, required VDOT to do security reviews at design and construction of lots versus sort of an afterthought. And I think that's going to be a consistent standard that they're going to apply as they look at all these lots to make sure that there's visibility, there's ways to can look way to identify when something's going wrong. Uh, Lord knows, anybody who commutes already, like I do over an hour each way, you don't want to come back and see your car has been put up on lots after a long, hard day and fight for traffic. Um, so I think we owe it to uh, you know commuters and taxpayers to try to get that right and, and solved early on. Um, Talk about education. I serve on um, SOL, uh, which is Standard of Learning. 
uh, the test that's given in schools of uh, innovation committee. Over the last couple of years, we have reduced the number of tests. Uh, in fact, from in high school from nine to five, and previous years we're continuing sort of that reduction, uh, which I think is a positive thing. A lot. I have a daughter in high school, one in middle school, one in elementary school, so I've seen sort of the testing culture at the peak with my oldest, and it's starting to get down with the anxiety that my kids felt before test day, which is incredible. Uh, completely different from when we went to school. Um, so we're working to uh, reform that. As a part of uh, efforts also to reform what we call the high school redesign we passed two years ago, allows kids in high school with their junior and senior years to get real world experience to account for graduation credit. And I think this is where we start to really build and connect the dots between where our kids want to go and what those futures might look like. And that might not be a four year degree. Okay, it might not you know, be a doctor. But we need people, I, I started out in construction, we need people that are mechanically inclined, other industries that are still skilled, their associate degrees and other skills, but we got to connect them early uh, in the fields to say, yep, you've got a Bible book, you missed what, you don't necessarily have to be settled with four year debt or master's degree, and you can make a really good living now too. Uh, I, I manage facilities, you can make eighty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 if you're a controls person. I also run a fleet shop. Cars are run by computers now, so are buildings. And so there's a, in the skill set we, that we need to continue to develop uh, throughout our community. And with that, this year I was also able to pass a, a bill that allows our school systems to waive, there's a 140 hour requirement for classes, um, for core classes. It allows the school systems to waive after the 140 hour requirement. The kids have already tested out for their math subject or science to allow the rest of the school year to be applied towards industrial certifications or apprenticeships. Again, towards that high school redesign process, how do we get kids looking towards jobs in the future, how they're going to get there. Um, and so I think the earlier pathways and what we can do, if we can get a kid coming out of high school that's has uh, certifications in OSHA 10 and CPR, other things that are employable, I think we're doing a much better job than we are, in, are today. So there's a, a couple other things, but I know our, our delegates are gonna touch base on them and I look forward to questions. All right, so I'm going to go next. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, you guys can do better. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. All right, that's great. Um, my name is Delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy, and as you stated, I represent Southeast Pretorium, North Stafford, and this is my first session. So I have to say that it was really exciting. Um, I had a great time. Um, I had some really passionate debates with a lot of different people um, that held completely different positions than I did. But that's the point, is pushing the envelope. Um, I introduced or proposed uh, 20 bills, and as a freshman, that's a lot. Um, but myself, Elizabeth Kuzman, we made a promise that we wanted to go down there to work, and that's exactly what we did. So I actually have four bills that passed this year that I'm really excited about. So I was a foster parent for about eight years. I have uh, foster children who are now in college, that are married, with their own kids. So it's something I'm really passionate about, because I believe that sometimes children who have been neglected and abused, sometimes all they need is an opportunity. And these children have suffered abuse and neglect, so the least we can do is give them some type of help in hand. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that in Virginia, we are 48th for placing foster children out of the foster home. Second to dead last. That means we're doing an atrocious job. So one of the first bills I put in was a foster care bill that made it easier for foster parents to adopt their foster children. So I'm really excited to have uh, worked with so many groups to actually get that passed. And I look forward to doing more to help uh, the foster children. I also have two education bills that passed. Um, one was a bill dealing with career and technical education. Um, and what that means is that there are combinations that's available to students who may not speak English as a first language or who have some type of disability. And there are accommodations available to them, but the problem is that they didn't know it. And so what my bill did is directed the Department of Education to notify all of these students with these special needs or these disabilities um, of the accommodations available to them so that way they can access them and get on an even playing field with other students. Um, my third bill was another education bill, and um, it was a, let's see, actually, 
coding bill. So what this bill did was um, say that if you tested proficient in a second language, that you did not have to take another second language, that you can actually take coding um, in replace of another foreign language. And so the coding community, like Girls Who Code and different other coding organizations are really excited about it. So in the General Assembly, we have a huge initiative that we want to promote coding and computational thinking to prepare our students for the global economy because that's where we're going, right? And so if they can learn about coding and uh, computer language early, they can actually take that information and apply from high school and apply to jobs paying as much as $20 to $25 an hour. And that's what we want to do. Um, and finally, my fourth bill was really boring. It was a search warrant uh, bill. I used to be a magistrate, which is a judicial officer. And so um, we had to write warrants, search warrants and arrest warrants. And if you are a night magistrate, because magistrates work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. And so if you were a night magistrate and you worked at three in the morning and an officer came in for an arrest warrant, a search warrant, oh, I'm sorry, a search warrant, a particular type of search warrant, you had to come in on your day off or during the day to personally deliver it to the court when it was needless. So what my bill did was say that that search warrant could be uh, service the same way all other search warrants have, are. So a lot of the magistrates were really appreciative. You guys probably don't care. But they cared and they loved it. Um, all right, some of our successes from this session I'm really excited about. Um, as it's touched on is Medicaid expansion. I think it's going to happen. Um, I think uh, Hanger, Wagner, and I believe Joe Vogel have come out and said their support. I know that we can't count on that until it's done, but this is some of the most progress that we've made. And even though right now it has potentially a work requirement that will be tied to it, 300,000 people being able to get access to affordable health care is better than none of those individuals being able to get access to affordable, uh, quality health care. So that's something I'm really excited about. Um, also, because we are expanding Medicaid, um, that allows us to take that funding that we otherwise would have put towards the state Medicaid and put actually $480 million towards education and the re-benchmarking um, for the standards of quality, and that's huge. Um, that's some of the money that should have been funded to education that has not been fully funded since the recession. Um, also, 2% in pay increases for teachers. Now that is something that I was very adamant about on the campaign trail, because I have a lot of teachers, specifically my district that lives around me, and I kept hearing the same story. And even now as a delegate, I've gone on tour, and I'm almost there, but it's my goal to introduce myself and meet every single principal in my district, Prince William and Stack, and I'm hearing the same stories, that they're losing teachers, the average is 20 to 25. And the question is why? Can you all think of why we're losing so many teachers in almost every single school in our district? Competitive pay. Competitive pay. Overcrowding. I'm sorry? Overcrowding. Overcut, yes, teaching conditions. And there's one more I didn't even think of, and I'm not even sure how to fix this. But this is like huge, it's paramount. Culture. Culture, exactly. They feel as if they're not respected that we do not hold teachers in the same high esteem that we used to, that now you have children who talk back, children who do some things that they can't even fathom that they have to be responsible for as teachers. And so that I'm not sure how to tackle. If you all have any great ideas, please let me know. But what we can do is pay them what they're worth. And so by expanding Medicaid and increasing teacher salaries by 2%, that's huge and that's a great step in the right direction. So I'm um, ready to get any questions that you all have after. And I think I'll give my two two minute warning, but I'm so excited to be here and happy to see all of you here too. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Guzman. I represent the areas of Del City, Lampreys, Montclair, and Manassas of 234 in Prince William County. And then my district goes all the way to Fauquier County. And in Fauquier, I represent the areas of Winfield, Baltimore, Catlett, and Casanova. I don't know how my district connects yet between Prince William and Fauquier County, but thank you, Jerry Mandarin. <laughs> I have <laughs> constituents all over the place. I've been recently elected as the first Hispanic female immigrant 
to the Virginia Assembly, and that's something that I take with pride and honor being able to represent a majority minority county like it's Prince Will. So I was also elected as the president of the freshman class. There were 15, were actually 16 new members in the House of Delegates from the Democratic Party, and I, I am the president of the class as well. Talking about bills, as Jennifer was mentioning earlier, you know, we, I challenge myself to present 28 bills. It's very unusual for a freshman, and also uh, quite a few budget amendments. And the reason was that we campaign all along about different issues, and we want to put our mouth where the money is. If we said we're fighting for certain issues, we would want to do it. So I have a whole scope of different issues that I will tell you what I fought for. So for example, in public education, I don't know if you are familiar, but for example, in Prince William County, we are working with the same amount of money in schools since 2008. And you probably are aware that our population has grown about three times. And we are facing in the eastern part of the county, and also in Dell City, which is the central part, because we're not eastern or western part, it's where we are facing overcrowded schools. So that's something that we shouldn't be proud about, and how is that affecting our children? So I presented a bill that it will put a ratio on high school counselors. So right now, the caseload for a high school counselor in Prince William County is one counselor to 450 students. What that means is the counselor could meet only 30 minutes a year with each student. And what it that also means, what are the consequences? That our children, we're not offering a career path to our children. As Jeremy was mentioning, counselors are so challenged that they, they cannot even meet with the students to see whether they are ready for college or not. They don't have help filling out applications. They, don't, they are not offered vocational surveys either. The most important part also is, you know, the mental health challenge, the amount of mental health challenges that we're facing right now is increasing. So these counselors, actually, according to the Code of Virginia, they should carry a license as a counselor, mental health counselors. So they don't have the opportunity to diagnose children while they are in a school to face this challenge. And most importantly, these counselors don't even have the time to help parents to become, so they could become a support system for their children. So that's what we're losing. And my bill was calling for a ratio of 1 to 250. Unfortunately, it was still on party line votes. But those are the bills that we were fighting for. That's on education, especially education. Also, if you are not familiar, many Eastern um, primary uh, elementary schools on the Eastern side, we have one special education classroom for a school, in elementary school. What that means is that our children will go to the same classroom regardless of the disability or the age. And as a social worker, as it was described earlier, I understand that there are different types of disabilities, right? We have severe disabilities and we got those that are moderate or low. Like for example, my child, he has a DHD, but he could sit in a classroom as long as he has medicine and he goes to therapy. When I, how did I learn this? Is when uh, I go, I transfer my child from a private school to a elementary school looking for support systems, and I went, when they assigned my child to this classroom, I saw that in the same classroom we had children with Down syndrome, bipolar disorder, autism. So I said, this is, I mean, there is no way that, I mean, my child is gonna learn in an environment like this. So I had to fight for him, and I, as I was knocking on doors, I also learned that that was the reality of many of my constituents. I remember one lady, when I was talking to her, that her child has a speech delay. Very smart child. Only disability is speech delay. This child was placed in a special education classroom. It was a fourth grade age and didn't know how to add or subtract. And was barely writing. So I, when I was looking at the Code of Virginia, the Code of Virginia calls for one, um, every eight children were supposed to have one educator with a special assistant. But we are so challenged here in Prince William County that we don't go by that. The, our caseload for special education children are 10 to one assistant. I was trying to change that. It's going to turn into a study in 2019, but those are the bills that we're fighting for. Criminal justice. I mean, I, I'm here 
sharing the floor with attorneys. And I feel like so we are talking about this, but that there are some things, accomplishments that we have. We increased the larceny threshold from 200 to 500. And that's something that Delegate Carroll and Scott Sorbo, and all of us, responsible. Because we have those problems in our high schools. For in my case, I presented a bill that passed that it was calling about the transition grant for wrongful incarcerated people. We do have cases, we didn't have a lot in Virginia, but we had quite a few. And what my bill does is provide a transition grant for a person who was found wrongfully incarcerated an amount of $15,000 within 30 days. This person, after he was in jail for seven, year, for seven years, 10 years, they leave the system without any support systems. Their family is gone, they lost their property, so at least this $15,000 will be a start for them to restart their lives. They'll get more money down the road, but that has to go through the Virginia Assembly. We have to be a session to approve how much money these wrongfully incarcerated people will get. Uh, also on transportation, I think that's something of my biggest accomplishments that you're familiar here in Prince William County, our transportation system is arcade. We have the same amount of buses, the same amount of buses stopped since 1998. And once again, our population has grown so much. And 70% of Prince William County residents commute outside of the district for a high paying job. So we are on the roads all the time. And many of us would like to take a bus at least on the weekend to go to the mall because we are on the road. I mean, and all of us work outside of the district actually, as well here. And Delegate Carpool works in Arlington, Jeremy and Alexandria, and Perfect. And Perfect. So we are all commuters. So um, I was able to work with, we had the identical bill, and I was going, uh, able to work with my partners across the aisle, Delegate uh, Chris Jones and Delegate Bob Thomas, and we were able to put a floor on the gasoline tax price. What that means is that now we will be able to fund and send more money to PRTC. It's about $7 million that will come to PRTC, and we want to see that money invested in public transportation. Uh, as far as Medicaid, I mean, I have solar energy as well for those interested in solar energy. I presented a bill that will require that any time a provider will, uh, they, any time an electricity company will build a new facility, the new facility will need to get at least 20% of the energy to be provided has to be from renewable sources. Unfortunately, unfortunately my bill was uh, killed on public lines as well. But it's okay, I'm coming back. I'm still working right now with the providers to make sure that because we have at least a lot of people interested, even here in Prince William County. It's uh, very expensive, and but that's something that we need to promote. I also present a bill that will provide a tax credit for those who would go renewable, but it was given by nine votes. So if you want to know more about the bills that we presented, please go to lis.virginia.gov and you can see the amount of bills that we presented and how we bought, I mean, how they were voted for. Finally, to talk about uh, Medicaid, you know, it's been the topic of the year and we are proud we were able to pass that and please just think, um, because sometimes people said, oh well, how Medicaid is going to affect me if I have insurance through my own Remember the amount of money that you are paying. It's high, and the reason is of the amount of people underinsured or without insurance. So the more people we insure, if there's anyone here in the business, we know that our crime, our rates would go down the more people that we have insured in the system. Thank you so much.